than I ever did in high school. But what I really want, my really question for you was, say in the global warming issue and there's people on both sides, uh, wouldn't you, do you think that uh, some of the government regulation may actually hinder that? And you, you yourself voted against the Kyoto Treaty in the 90s. Uh, and I guess I was just wondering if, if, cap if you would think that capitalism and, and the whole idea of pushing that rather than and taking off government regulation would more promote the growth in this area. Now, you raised a great question. I actually taught environmental studies at West Georgia College in the early 70s. I participated in the Second Earth Day. And I, I've been very involved on environmental issues. And actually, on Monday, we have a new book coming out uh, called Contract with the Earth, which uh, Terry Maple and I have written, and which is really designed to talk about what I describe as green conservatism. And it's, and it's exactly your point, which is uh, if you want to get dramatic improvement, and, and I'm, I'm in favor as a conservative of, of limiting the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere, because I would argue you don't have to win, you don't have to convincingly, overwhelmingly prove to me that carbon loading in the atmosphere is dangerous. All you have to prove to me is that there are reasonable grounds to worry about it. I, I, don't, I don't think you have to have some standard that's impossible. You, and, and I think there are reasonable grounds to worry about it. So how would you, how would you then behave? I think you, you set up prizes. I think you set up incentives. I think that you, you redesign how we do things in terms of litigation and regulation. I'll give you a single number. If, if we had as much of our electricity coming from nuclear power, as the French do, that one change would reduce 2 billion, 200 million tons a year of carbon in the atmosphere. That's 15% better than Kyoto. Now, that doesn't require massive federal regulation in Washington. It requires rethinking the licensing procedure. It requires a tax break for, for power that doesn't give off any carbon. And, and there are a whole range of these things. All of the effort we've made on, 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 uh, bio, on, on biological renewables, uh, which is, I think, going to pay off, whether you're talking about ethanol in its current form, which is corn, or you're talking about soy diesel, or you're talking about, I think, the next cycle, which is going to be cellulosic ethanol. I think you're going to find that in terms of the carbon cycle, that that solves a lot of problems. And it also has a second order effect, which is we have, when we talk about energy, you should always talk about the economy, the environment, and national security. Uh, we, are, we are insane to have a national energy strategy that gives enormous power to Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and Russia. And we should have as a national strategy a desire to use science and technology and to use market forces to minimize our reliance on dictatorships around the world and to make them relatively irrelevant in terms of the quality of life and the stability of our economy. I think those are much better done by using market forces and entrepreneurs and, and science and technology than it would be by using bureaucrats and trial lawyers and litigation and regulation. So there's a fundamental argument, if you want to achieve something, which of these two models is more likely to achieve it? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, Speaker Gingrich, thank you so much for being here today and, and what a great introduction you gave. Um, partisanship in this country seems to be extremely high right now, um, which is a potential problem perhaps when, when dealing with a lot of the great changes that might be developing over the next 50 years. Your thoughts on how to best uh, take the best of both political parties and combine them together in a spirit of compromise in order to move uh, policies forward in this country? Well, that's a great question. I, I, I was asked earlier by a reporter uh, who seemed amazed that Senator Clinton and I could agree on the idea of health information technology and the notion that electronic prescribing and electronic health records make sense. And, and I, I wasn't clever enough, but I wish what I'd said to him was, look, if it was 1915 and there was a discussion about whether the, whether the best ambulance was drawn by horses or used an internal combustion engine, that wouldn't be actually a liberal or conservative argument. I mean, it'll be an objective, practical argument. Which, which one is likely to get you to the hospital faster and more reliably? And sometime around 1915, trucks passed on, you know, horse-drawn buggies as a reliable delivery system, and you'd be fairly nuts to say, well, and this is where we are, by the way, with paper in, in, uh, in healthcare. I, I co-authored, uh, along with Dave Merritt, a book at the Center for Health Transformation called Paper Kills, because that, that's my attitude towards paper in the health system. It's, it's very dangerous, and it kills people. So that's not, to me, that's not an ideological argument. I mean, if Senator Clinton and I have both figured out 
that in the age of the Blackberry and the iPod and the iPhone and, and you know, cell phones with cameras that we ought to figure out a way to migrate healthcare to being electronic. That, that's a commitment to a technological future which has nothing to do with right or left. And I, th I think the country is fed up with a red versus blue automatic partisanship. And the country would actually like to see red, white, and blue conversations. And I tried to get the Des Moines Register to actually host bipartisan presidential debates. I, I thought it would take uh, half the poison out of the system. If you, if you got people to meet in the same room, on the same platform, because what happens today is the Democrats run over here and chant, we hate Bush, and the Republicans run over here and chant, we're afraid of Hillary, and you get this, <laughs> you get this utterly mindless kind of partisanship, and they're, they're, but, but they're applauded in their own rooms. But if they were in the same room, you just couldn't have that stupid a conversation. And so I, I do think we're at a point, a real turning point in American history. And, and we created a system called American Solutions, which if you go to americansolutions.com, you'll see it. We're, we just finished six national polls. We're giving those to every Democrat and every Republican. We're, the, the data we're releasing, we release to everybody because we want to start a conversation that actually gets people to talk with each other across party lines. Yes? Um. First, thank you for coming today. It's been very interesting to listen to you. Um, and you did a great job last year, too. I thought you had a very interesting speech. Um, you've talked a lot today about how we're going to be helping technology develop in, in really in the already developed world. And uh, we've seen technology over the past 25 years grow at also an incredibly rapid rate. Um, but we've seen that in countries um, where maybe it is economically feasible to do so. If technology increases at a rate of four or seven times in the next 25 years, um, I guess what are your thoughts on how that can be utilized to, in, you know, in the developing world where, I mean, I, assuming that it'll trickle down and just you know, help people in areas where technology isn't developing as quickly, it may not be realistic as we, has, we haven't seen that happening. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think you raised one of the most interesting conversation points in the modern intellectual world. And I'm going to try to answer this in a way, and this may lead to some other questions. Because we, we almost completely misdiagnose what's happening in places where they aren't making progress. Because it is so politically incorrect to be honest about it. So let, let me make a try at this for a second. First of all, Technology and the world economy have brought at least two billion people out of poverty into much better developed status. If you visit China today, if you visit India today, if you go to uh, key areas around the world and places that used to be very poor, it is breathtaking how many people now are successful. Gallup does a world poll, which is a fascinating study. They've made a commitment that they're going to go into 125 countries every year for the next 100 years and build a world database. You do a thousand plus sample in every country. And I was getting briefed by them recently. 97% of urban Chinese have color television. And in fact, recently the UN, to my great surprise, actually had an optimistic report that conceded that there were more people above the poverty line by huge numbers than there were 15 years ago. Now, because people on the left don't like to admit that technology works, and they don't like to admit that markets work, and they desperately want to raise your taxes to build a bigger bureaucracy to transfer your money to somebody else, they can't focus on this. But let me just start with this, with this first objective reality. More people today live better lives with greater incomes and with better futures than ever in the history of the human race. And that's part of why I'm confident that in the absence of a catastrophe, you're going to see a continuing movement towards a huge renaissance, because you're going to have people who are smart Chinese and smart Indians and smart Thais, you know, and, and all around the planet, smart Brazilians, smart Argentinians, smart Mexicans. I mean, all around the planet, there are people contributing who 400 years ago weren't in the game. When, when, when modern scientific technological markets began in, in Venice, and in Holland, um, there were very few people who were participating. Now there are billions participating. So what about the places that aren't succeeding? I want to deliver a message.